good evening and welcome everybody to this edition of Breaking Out. My name is Matt Meganson. I'm the incoming senior pastor here at Parkway Baptist Church in the Nashville area. So glad that you have joined us today. So I've been the incoming pastor for a week now, transitioning in, and well, the building's still standing. So, so far, so good, right? But I'm excited to be with you today. Last week, you, ha you got to hear from Mark and G. Settle, and they came and shared with us from God's Word, and, and they had a great reveal for us that they're expecting their first child. So Mark and Giselle, congratulations on your, on your big announcement. We're excited about your, your young one that's coming, and we're, as a church family, we're rejoicing with you and how blessed you are. Um, Mark and G. gave us a great word from, you know, from God, and they, they challenged us to sacrifice ourselves. They said that if we're going to be the kind of church that God wants us to be, then there's a sacrifice involved. If we're going to go where God wants us to go to the future, then we're going to have to sacrifice our comfort, our desires, our preferences, and even our opinion. And I thought that was a great challenging word as we, as we pray about and think about where God wants us to be as a church, not just today, but moving forward and into the future, how we can be more effective as a church. So thank you for that, guys. As I was thinking about our broadcast today and, and what kind of Bible story we could look at, I just wanted to start today with a question. And my question for you is this. If you see something that's not right, what do you do about it? If you're in the mall and you see something that's going on that's not right, what do you, what's your first reaction to that? If you're a parent and you have a child that's at school and something about that school's direction or a policy or something that's going on and you disagree with it, what is your first thought about that? If there's something going wrong at your church and there's something about your church that you don't, that you don't agree with, what, what's your first response to that? Is, do you respond to all these things? By, and like number one, would you, did you just tell somebody? Do you go home and just tell somebody, you're not going to believe what they're doing over there? Honey, listen, I got to tell you, you're not going to believe this. Sit down, I got a story to tell you. Or, do, or maybe you respond as maybe number two, you you go tell somebody in authority, you say, y'all need to fix that. Y'all need to stop doing that. And that's, how, that's your response to that. I want to tell somebody what's wrong, and I want somebody else to fix it. Or number three, do you want to just go fix it yourself? Are you the kind of person that just says, that's not right, and I'm going to go fix it right now? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm going to get a plan, and I'm going to get some people together, and we're just going to go knock that thing out, and we're going to just fix that right now. Which one are you? As I'm naming those three, which one is you? If you see something that you think's not right, what is your first response to that? And while you're thinking of that, I would just like to propose that maybe there's one more option that I didn't list. Maybe there's something that we should do first that I didn't mention on that list. Maybe there's something that, that we're missing out to say that when I see something wrong, I, I should do this. And what we're going to look at today is a story in the Bible that tells us what do you do when you see things that aren't wrong? When you, see, when you see things that aren't going right in your church, what do you do? When you see things that aren't right at school and in your family and in a relationship, what do you do first? And I was trying to think of some Bible stories to illustrate this, and the first story that came to mind was Nehemiah. And I said, no, 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 we can't talk about Nehemiah because we just, we just finished the Old Testament. We don't need to go back there. I said, I need to find something in the New Testament. And I started looking at a story, and I said, this is a good story. Or this will be a good story. And then, but but the, the thought of Nehemiah kept coming up. And I said, no, 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 we can't do Nehemiah, because we just, we just talked about some of those things. And again, it came up again and again. And I finally realized that I just said, okay, God, if you want to talk about Nehemiah, then who am I to say that we can't go look at Nehemiah again? It's the perfect example of what I wanted to share with you today. What do you do when your church isn't going in the right direction? What do you do when your life isn't going in the right direction? And it's not tell somebody, and it's not get somebody else to do it, and it's not even you fix it. We're going to look together at the story of Nehemiah and see what he did first. Let me, let me catch you up to where we are in the story of the Old Testament. God's people had been in rebellion, and God sent warnings to them through the prophets. And over and over again, he sent them warnings saying, you need to stop, and you need to be true to me. And over and over again, they rejected the voice of God. And when they rejected him, 
God said, if you don't change, punishment will come. And they continued on. And so God sent the Assyrians to come down and wipe out. And God took them back into slavery. And, they, and the rest of the people there continued to, dis, to disobey. And they continued to rebel. And God warned them with more prophets. And he kept coming in with more prophets. And, they, and that's all of the Old Testament of all these prophets that you read. Some of these that you've never heard of like Habakkuk. And people like that. And Joel and these other. They're coming in and they're giving warnings. And Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. And we can go on and on. And all these prophets are warning the people to say, God's telling you to repent and be true to me. And yet they said no. And so then God sent the Babylonians to come down and to wipe out the rest of the people. And they took the smart ones back to Babylon. And they left some people there to struggle and eke out a, some kind of an existence right there in the Holy Land. And those that he took back to Babylon, um, they had a pretty good existence as long as they were agreeable to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. And then there are stories that happen while they're there uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and, and all these type of stories that you remember, that, those all happen while they're up in Babylon. But our story today begins after the Persians come in and they take over Babylon and the people, God's people are still up in captivity. And so we're going to read from Nehemiah today as he hears terrible news about a problem that's going on with God's people. Something has happened down in Jerusalem that breaks his heart. And he has a problem and he has a decision that he needs to make. And we're going to learn from how he responds to this. Let's read it together. Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 1. And it says, In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile. And I asked them also about Jerusalem. And they said this to me. They said, those who survived the exile, they are back in the province, but they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. He said that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. The problem that Nehemiah learns that breaks his heart is that Jerusalem's walls have been torn down. That means there's no protection for them from anybody who might be living in the area. Robbers and bandits can come in at any time of the night. And they can take and steal from them. They can't protect themselves. They can't grow crops. They can't have any kind of possessions. They can't raise a family because people just come in and take whatever they want. Armed men, armed, armed, ar small armies will just come in and they'll just take whatever they want. You can't rebuild a life without protection. When you go home at night, you go home to a house and you close the door and you put a lock on it. And you go to bed assuming that when you wake up that everything that you had would still be there. You assume that you're, you're safe at night when you sleep. When you, when you leave your car and go to a store, you lock your door and you assume that it's going to be fine. They had no assurances of anything. How can you live with no assurance of safety? You know that you don't know if you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and people are going to be in your house taking your belongings. They're going to be doing things to your family. They're going to be taking everything that you own. It's no way that you can live in peace and harmony. You can't grow. You can't flourish. You can't prosper. And this is what's happening to everybody that's in Jerusalem. No one there is prospering. Although some people came back to rebuild the temple, it's, it's, it's a tough go. And because the walls are torn down, they're just never going to be successful until they can restore some safety and some boundaries in their life. And Nehemiah reads this. He hears this, and it breaks his heart because he feels for, I'm all the way up here in Babylon, and the problem is way down there, and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm sure that the first thing he wanted to do is just to be a fix-it kind of guy and just go... And fix it. I mean, God is not being honored down there. It's my duty to go and fix that. He wants to run down and just, and just do whatever it takes to fix it. Is that you? Are you a fix-it kind of guy? I am not a fix-it kind of guy. And my wife will give testimony to the fact that I don't know how to fix a lot of things. But I'll tell you, YouTube can, can teach you a whole lot about fixing things. I remember when we were moving into our house and 
we didn't like the ceiling fans that were in the house. And I said, I could, I could put in a ceiling fan. And Heather kind of looked at me like, okay, number one, don't, don't electrocute yourself. And more importantly, don't burn down the house. And I said, really? Give me a chance. I can watch YouTube like the rest of them. And I watched YouTube and I saw how to do it. And sure enough, I was able to install some ceiling fans. The same thing happened when the sump pump went out under our house. I got under the house and I was like, oh, I can fix this. And what did Heather say? Hey, don't electrocute yourself and don't burn down the house. But you know what? I didn't burn down the house. I was able to do a few things, and I didn't want to call an electrician to come and just do a simple fix. I wanted to be a fix-it kind of guy, and to be honest with you, it kind of made me, it made me feel good. We have this saying around our house, and this comes from an old TV show called The Red Green Show. It used to be on PBS a long time ago, and he would fix stuff with duct tape and just kind of wire it all back together, and he used to say this. He said, if the women don't find you handsome, make sure they find you handy. Make sure you can fix something and be valuable around the house. So whenever I fix something, I say, Heather, you may not find me handsome, but at least you're finding me handy today. And she'll laugh and she'll smile and she'll say, you're still handsome. And I'll say, well, thank you. I'm glad I can be both today, handsome and handy. But Nehemiah probably wanted to be handy. He probably wanted to rush down there and fix the problem because that's what most people would do. Let me ask you, is that what you do when there's a problem in your life? When there's something that's broken, the first thing you want to do is just, I'm just going to fix this. I know it needs to be done. I can be the guy. I can be the girl. I can just go and watch YouTube, and I can just fix my life. What about in your church? If your church is not where it should be, if you disagree with the direction it's going, or you think it should be going in a different direction, do you think, I can fix this? If I yell out enough, if I complain to enough people, if I go talk to the right person, maybe I can get something done because God's not being glorified. Nehemiah wanted to do something for God. He wanted to go fix something for God. Maybe sometimes you feel like it, you want to fix something for God. You, you have a holy cause. You have a crusade to fight for. I'm going to do this for Jesus because I know that it's right. And I know that something needs to be fixed, so I'm going to do it myself. You see what I'm saying? I am going to do it myself. I wonder if that's what Nehemiah did. You know what, Nehemiah, he didn't... He didn't make a plan first. He didn't go tell people first. He didn't go try to fix it first. He did something else first. I want you to read with me verse 4 and see what the missing ingredient that you and I need to do first. Let's see what Nehemiah did. In verse 4, he said, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, and I fasted, and I prayed before God of heaven. Did you catch that? He fasted and he prayed before he ever acted, before he ever made a plan. He knew there was a need, but he took that need to God first. He took to the need and said, God, I want, but I, that's not what's most important. What's most important is what you want. God, I, I need you to go before me. I need you to make a way because I can't fix this myself. Maybe he felt like he could fix it. But the truth of the matter is, he could not. Let's read this prayer that he prays to God. This is an unbelievable prayer of honesty before God. And let's see how God responds. Continue on in verse 5. This is his prayer to God. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant with love, with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. And hear the prayer of your servant that's, play, that's praying before you day and night for your servants and these people of Israel. I confess that the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, that we've committed against you, we have acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, your decrees and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions that you gave to your servant Moses, God, when you said, if you were unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. That's interesting, because where are they right now? Scattered among the nations. And he's quoting God's word. God, you promised Moses these things. Would you please honor your word? He said that you said that if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, and if you obey my commands, then even if you're exiled people, and if, if you're spread from the farthest horizon, I will gather you from there 
and bring you to a place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Where would that place be? That would be Jerusalem. He said, even though you're scattered, if you will return to me, then I will bring you back together and make you whole again. He goes on to say, God, they are your servants and your people. Talking about the people who were scattered. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to this prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight and revere in your name. Now watch this. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He said, give me favor in the presence today of this man. I wonder what man he's talking about. He's asking God, he's confessing. One, he's saying, God, we confess that we haven't been faithful to you. And then he quotes God's words and said, but you said that if, if we change, that you will bring us back together. And then he asked something of God. God, give me favor. He's saying, God, prepare the way. God, go before me, but I need favor from this man, King Artaxerxes. You see, he was the cupbearer for the king. And he is in the king's presence every day. And in just a few minutes after this prayer, he's going to go and sit before the king. And he said, if I could just get favor with the king, then maybe if God allowed that, I could do something about the problem in Jerusalem. He didn't run ahead of God. He asked God. And he listened. And as he sat for days and days praying this prayer, God, would you please do a miracle? Will you please do, do something not for me, but for the others? Because your church is in trouble. Your temple is in trouble. The city of Jerusalem, your jewel, your, the heartbeat of God in, in Jerusalem is in trouble. And I want this for you, God, but you have to do it. Have you ever prayed that prayer for God? To say, God, I want this in my life, but you have to do it. I can't do it. Do you want that for your church? To say, God, I want this for my church, but I can't do it. You have to do it, God. You and you alone can do this. And so he asked for favor. The key is to ask God to fast and to pray and to mourn for what breaks your heart. Don't run ahead of him. Don't make plans on your own. Ask God to be involved and then wait on his answer. The results of his prayer is that he goes before King Artaxerxes and he gets his answers. Let's read it. Down in chapter 2, it says, In the month of Nisan... In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. That's the same year. That's the same year as chapter 1. It's the 20th year. But Nisan is a different month. So we're in a different month now. Same year. When wine was being brought for the king. I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me. Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid. That means he was afraid to say what he's fixing to say. He was afraid to ask. Because if the king was, found displ was displeased with him because of what he asked, he would have him thrown in jail or worse. He said, I'm, I was afraid to ask this. But, but I said this to the king. May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins? And its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heavens and I answered the king. He lifted up a prayer really quick to God. God, help me here. Help me say this right. And please, God, give me favor right here when I need it most. And he said, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, please let him Send me to the city of Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him said, How long will your journey take and when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me. And so I set a time. He found favor with the king. Most of the times a king wouldn't do something like that. He couldn't just ask for something and just assume that just let me go to another country. Let me go on a journey that's going to take me a thousand miles away and I don't know when I'm going to come back. But I'm going to go down there and I'm going to make a difference for these people. Why would King Artaxerxes, why would he let him go and to go to make a difference for a group of people and to worship a God that, he, that Artaxerxes didn't even believe in? 
But God gave him favor with the king. And he said, okay, you can go. And sometimes when you hear the story that he not only sent him, but he gave him resources. Who do you need to take with you? What do you need to make it happen? And so Nehemiah gets the blessings of them. I wonder sometimes if we not run ahead of God when we need God to do something in our lives, when we need God to be a blessing for us and we, we don't ask him, we just go. When God's willing to bless us and to do all the work for us, but instead, God, I've got to work harder at my job. I need favor with my boss, and so I've got to work till midnight every day. And I've got to change everything that I'm doing. And I've got to work harder and make an impression. And the story of Nehemiah is, that's not what you do first. The first thing you do is you kneel and pray. And you seek God's face and you ask him, God, I need you to go before me. I need favor with my boss. And God, I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking for you to honor you and for my family to provide for my family. But we ask God to be in the middle of the circumstances of our life at work and ask him to prepare the way. If things are going bad at home, do you just try to, you just try to fix it yourself and try to apologize more? All right, I'm not going to do that anymore. I, I promise I'm going to make a change. And, but you know, we're human and change only lasts for so long unless our heart is right with God. And we say, God, I need your help. I need favor from you, God. I need you to, to break my heart and give me the courage and the wisdom to change the right way. The first thing we do for ourselves is we don't just try it ourselves. The first thing we do is we do what Nehemiah did, and we just kneel before God and pray and say, God, please speak. God, please provide. As we think about our church and how we want to be more effective in reaching our community, we want to be more effective in being a lighthouse to the world. We, we think about the future direction that God wants for us. We don't, just, we don't just want to go in the direction that we think we should go. We don't just say, well, I want this or I think that. We should first stop and pray. And the question should not be, who do I tell or who do I tell to change it or what do I need to do first? The first thing we do is to say, God, what do you want? Where do you want us to be as a church three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now? What should we be doing to prepare for what you want for us, God? Speak to us and give us your wisdom and your plan, not our wisdom and our plan, because those things will fail. We might get it wrong if we guess the direction we, we, we think we should go. We have to stop and ask and pray earnestly and fast and pray with him and say, God, where do you want us to be? And then we listen for God's guidance. And we say, God, thank you for your direction, and now will you make a way for us? Will you lead the way and give us favor with our community and with men? And so as we reach out to them, they hear and they respond. The first step is always to seek after God, to pray and to pray and to pray. Let's don't be a fix-it kind of guy where we just want to fix everything just because we're dissatisfied with where we are or what we think the church should be about. Let's don't just say, I'm going to just jump in there and make it happen. I'm going to talk loud enough and complain enough to the right people to get something done. Instead, let's go to God and let's say, God, what do you have for us? Because prayer is always the first step. We need to ask God. We need to pray, pray, and pray. So I'm just going to ask that you would join me right now in doing that. Would you just bow your heads where you are right now? I just want to spend some time praying and asking God for his wisdom in your life and in our church. Can we pray about that? Holy Father, I just come before you because you are the one that has all the answers. God, if we guess, we're going to guess wrong. If we believe that we think that we know, we probably don't. The wisdom of, of the world you frustrate. The wisdom of man, can we cannot comprehend the things of God. We can't comprehend your greatness and your goodness and your faithfulness. You know all things. You are all things. And so we can trust you. And so tonight we can sit at your feet and say in our lives today, we don't know what to do. There's a situation in our lives right now that we're confused about. 
and we don't know how to fix it, and we don't know what our response should be. And I just pray, God, that today we just say, God, would you show us? Would you speak to our hearts now and let us just trust you to, to guide us? Tell us, give us the wisdom of what to say and what not to say in that situation. Give us the wisdom to show grace and mercy. Give us the wisdom to know how to act and how to respond. And as we sit at your feet and listen for your guidance, God, once we hear you, give us the courage to surrender to you and to respond in the way that you're leading. God, I want to lift up our church today. And as Parkway is, is, is beginning a new journey with you, God, I know that you have great plans, but we want to make sure that our ideas are not just our ideas. Because if we guess, we're going to get it wrong. If we think, then we probably don't. We need to stop and sit at your feet today, God, and say, please speak to us in a real and powerful way about where we should go as a church, the direction we should go, how we should go, when we should go, and that we'll sit at your feet until you speak. And then as you do reveal it to us, God, we ask that you would go before us, that you, almighty God, would lead your church in a way that's going to glorify you. It's going to save people. It's going to rescue people. It's going to transform communities. It's going to be a lighthouse to the world around us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him. And God, we just, that's all that we want. We just want what you want. We just want you to do a miracle in their midst, and we want to give you all the glory for it. And we're just thankful that we get to be a small part of that. God, forgive us when we run ahead of you. Forgive us when we try to do instead of trusting you to do it. And I pray, God, that we would humble our hearts and uh, pray that we would just be in complete submission to you and to your will. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope that you'll remember the story of Nehemiah this week. As you're going through your week and you remember, don't run ahead of God. Include him in every decision that you make. He has a plan for you. And the Bible says that his plan is good, pleasing, and perfect. Trust it. He's not going to lead you astray. He's going to go with you and before you and prepare the way for you as you include him in your daily life. So thank you for being part of our broadcast today. I'd like to remind you that this next Sunday is a special day in the life of our church. And for those of you watching overseas and in other states, we know that you probably can't come join us in person. But we're going to have one worship service this Sunday as we celebrate our, our pastor Ken Castleberry's last Sunday with us. He's been here for 15 years at Parkway. He's an incredible man of God. And we're going to celebrate with a, with a baptism and a baby dedication. And Brother Ken's going to be preaching his last message here as the senior pastor of Parkway. And it's going to be a great time of celebration. We're going to start at 1030 on this Sunday. It's a different time than what we normally meet. Uh, just one service. There's going to be extra seating in the balcony. There's going to be overflow section for people to come in person. And then on Sunday afternoon, there's a special time when people can come and greet Ken and Susan in person to say a special word. There's going to be a drive-by greeting, and you're going to drive by them, and they're going to stand outside of your car, and you'll get a chance to speak to them through the car. There's a place where you can, you can write a letter, and you can make a card that you want to give, and you can give that to them to read letter, uh, later on as well. We just want this to be a special day for Ken and Susan Castleberry for a job well done and just to express our love to them. So if you are watching from a distance and you can't come, please join us at 1030. It'll be broadcast here on Facebook Live. The rest of us, we hope that you'll consider coming to be a part of this worship service at 1030 on Sunday celebrating Ken. God bless you, and I hope that you'll uh, walk with the Lord this week. Thank you very much.